Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we discuss the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. We pick from the thousands of business books out there and test the author's ideas by comparing them to real-world challenges. With over 40 years of projects between us, we've got quite a bit to compare against. We give you the condensed takeaways, followed by our interview with the author. We know you want actions, not theories, and it is actions that we want to help shape, because that's what the Wicked Podcast is all about. Hey, Marcus, I'm really, really excited about talking to Graham today. I mean, I know we've met him before, but uh, this is such an interesting topic, and, and the book was really, really great. Yeah, so, you know, Graham, he's, he's one of my friends now, and, uh, you know, we met him doing the barbecue that we mentioned uh, later in the interview. So his his um, his book, as a, it's got a working title at the moment here, just about finishing it. So we're getting first dips here. It's awesome. And it's called Picasso and Einstein. The economy, leadership, and you. And there's tons of things in there that are really strong and big ideas. But um, let's have a quick chat about, let's start with your takeaways from, from the book and the interview. I think one, one of the takeaways is the, the, the where can you start? And where can I start? Where can you start? Where can people who are listeners to start? The, the Fair Shares Commons ideas are really big, and they're really big and far-reaching at a corporate structure level. That doesn't mean that you can't bring some of the core ideology into the workplace, even in a small team or a business unit sort of level. When you start looking at balancing stakeholders across everything that you're doing and start thinking that way within your teams, it'll have a further reaching effect across the organization and, and up to the company level. So that's been one of the first things that I would say is a, is a significant takeaway. The second one is, and I, and I said it during the during the podcast, this is not a light switch moment. This is not where we wake up tomorrow and everyone is going to change all of their corporate structures to fair trades commons. It's going to be a slow process. Yes, Visa is doing it. Yes, the John Lewis and Partners is doing it. We need more companies doing it. So if you have any evidence or any actual companies that are fair trades commons, start shouting about them, start telling people about them and start telling them about the investors that you have in them and that it's actually working. And those are my two big takeaways. Yeah. So for me, it's it's like that, you know, when I look at that towards how to tackle COVID-19 and this new world and uncertainty of it, it's not too dissimilar what I've been looking at innovation for a long time as well. So, so therefore, one of my takeaways is that when you do that, it's a lot about going back to the purpose of your organization. And can do that with or without fair shares. It actually doesn't matter. But, you know, as a first step, as a survival focal point, what you probably want to do is to say, right, why do we exist in the first place? What problem are we solving? If you pull back on that, it makes the decisions going forwards and how to grow and expand and save yourself as a company much clearer and simpler. Because if you have identified that need to solve for a customer, and the way you ex can expand around that, that's, that's where your future growth lies. That's where you should enable your people around it. So one thing for me, first takeaway is like, yes, go back to the essence. And what Graham says, write that into the purpose of your company, because actually, legally, you're not bound to shareholders by law in UK and US, as he said, that's a myth. Uh, so you can actually focus on that and do that as a company. The second part nearly a second step of that or follow up and dependency on that as a takeaway for me, therefore, is, well, if you want to do that as a company and you have a purpose, what's the purpose of your people and how do you have to grow them in order to be able to do that? Because I'm pretty sure that a lot of companies now had to let people go or uh, furlough them um, and they have less people to recoup the loss everyone just made of a whole quarter, at least, of financial loss. How do you recoup that with less people? It's insane because cutting people is just temporary. So the thing is, how do you grow people? Because now you will, you will likely, as a leadership, as a leader, expect your existing leftover people to do the same work or more than what you previously did with more people. So that means your people have to grow. They have to uh, be doers more than potentially thinkers. That means they have to learn new skills very quickly. They have to um, have multiple skills, multiple viewpoints, maybe contradictory viewpoints in order to test things as quick as they can in order to actually get every day a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. So they have to try whatever they can. 
be, be, be outcome and purpose based, based on the organization and wrap themselves around that task. And that sort of is my second takeaway. And on top of that, I think it's really important to put in the, a lot of these fair shares comments align not just more doing, more learning, improvement, but also more reward and more risk distribution. So if we're going to ask the people to do a lot more to help us come out of the crisis and to reinvent ourselves and to transform our businesses into the new normal, we're not going back to the old normal, to the new normal, there's got to be something in it for them. And Fair Shares Commons allows for that. So there should be a temporary structure that allows for those workers that remain who put in the extra graft to rebuild and reinvent the business to benefit from that process. Yeah, I think that's just one of these big things that just came up now that I never realized or um, Graham never explained to me like that. But the whole idea that actually what it can do is cut out the government by, you know, uh, supporting the local the local community through first taxes, through the government, and then back invested into the community, but by directly moving that value or currency into the community, cutting out middle mouth government, which... I was like, that's great. That's actually the conservatives. They want more government. That's bringing them back on board to really embrace something so different as an idea. But the thing, therefore, I really liked about is exactly that. You go, why are we not, um, as a company, more connecting? So interconnectedness is what Graham says a lot, which I think is a bit of a predicament to what we're trying to do, to, to, to do things like, know a little bit more where your company and organization sits, realizing that the people who work for you are in those communities. If you start with that stuff, you quickly get to the point where, and you see that over in the US quite failing, to go back to like, hang on a second, everyone needs healthcare. I as an organization make everything possible that everyone has at least healthcare, is safe, secure, has child support, all these things that organizations tend to, you know, uh, cut off at times and trying to in order to try to be more profitable it's like stop doing that because if you do that if you put that additional pressure on people just just don't do that you will not help have people put that extra effort and extra value into your company because it becomes a different battle right and that's the battle you don't want to have the battle that happens is surviving and growing the value of your company not minimizing the value you're giving back to the workers who are now doing more than ever before and they have to in these days Cool. Lovely. So, yes, big ideas. It was a really good interview. Uh, the, the book is so full of stuff. Um, and we always say that, that we, we, we can't ask enough questions in the time we have. It's definitely true for this one. But on top of it, it's, it's one of those ideas that sits further out, but is actually already existing. And that's the big point. I think there's already a connection we can make. We're living in a very interesting time with these kind of things probably should happen and they're probably going to create a better world so it's going to be interesting how much they're going to be embraced so let's listen to the interview let's do it hello graham and uh welcome to the wicked podcast thank you very much marcus i'm grateful and glad to be with you same here so uh, uh a little full disclosure to our listeners today um uh we know each other so troy graham and me uh so i think the last time we had a very interesting chat was last year during a barbecue at my place and at the time we were already talking about your book and uh, all the interesting ideas in it and so uh jumping into that uh so tell us a little bit more graham about the, the, the very interesting title of the book and how it sort of relates what the core message and, and, and uh, context of the book is that, that we'll, we'll going to go and talk about. Thank you, Marcus. So the book has a long origin. The Where I've got to and what led me to write the book was a conversation with an economist at an economics conference, Rethinking Economics, that I dropped into and I was already exploring the whole question of if we have different ways of leading, if we have different ways of structuring and running organizations, and we approach incorporating organizations differently, surely this must lead to a different kind of economy. 
and I was chatting to him and we came up with the idea of, right, let's write a book that spans the entire, um, all of the layers of complexity from the global economy all the way through to the complexity of each of us as individual human beings, our inner lives, our development as human beings, specifically with a focus on how can we use the latest understanding across all of these different layers to address our global challenges like climate change, the pandemic that we're in at the moment, the 17 sustainable development goals. What do we need to do differently for all of that? And the bit where Picasso and Einstein come into this, my background is primarily physics with a little bit of an understanding of art. And Jack's background is primarily economics and art with some roots in physics. And we, we recognize very quickly is that the reason why we've always looked at the world differently to most people is because we're solidly grounded in the way that Einstein looked at the world as he was developing relativity and his role in developing quantum mechanics and the way that Picasso looked at the world that led to cubism emerging as a new way of representing reality on canvas. And so the essence of the book is all about how can we use the lenses of Einstein and Picasso and now use those lenses to look at business, the economy, leadership, and individual development, self-development, to get a better understanding of what is really going on here. Because it's perfectly clear that the way we're showing up in the world today, the way business works, the way leadership works, the way the economy works, isn't working. And we need to reinvent all of those to get something that does work, that is capable of addressing the challenges that we're facing globally. These challenges all have their roots in dysfunctionalities in the current paradigm, the lenses we're looking at business leadership and the economy through. So that's the essence of the book. And that's the red thread running through the whole book is using the lenses that led to the development of quantum mechanics, relativity, and cubism and now a century later, reapplying them for the fundamental transformation we need in the world of business, leadership, self-development, and the economy. Wow. I think I love this because um, obviously um, part of my background as well is, is art. So I've done a bit of art as well uh, and, uh, you know, worked with engineering code and these kind of things. So I love when someone really brings these seemingly far apart um, approaches to things together. But I think... What strikes me most about it is exactly what, when you say that, well, there is a paradigm, a shift essentially that they applied in order to look at things differently. Interestingly enough, and that's another thing, you know, I, I love when patterns reappear, you know, because we know all of us, you know, whenever we talk, it's like, you know, we have these, we have these ideas and we always feel like we're just very few people who have these ideas, but it's always great to see different patterns. So uh, as a reference, so Sunny Giles, who was the first one uh, in, uh, the, the, we interviewed in episode one, she looked at leadership under the, 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 the view of, or under the, 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 the filter or, yeah, under the filter of, of, of quantum mechanics. So she, she, she applied something similar to it. So you're bringing art as well into that about shifting the way we look at things because it's not working. Um, yeah, I mean, I totally, I totally love that. And can, can I just say that, you know, number one, uh, well done for actually getting it into a single book because the the topic is so vast. You know, you could have easily written, you know, a, a whole series of books. But the other thing is, if our listeners and, and other people kind of say, oh, so we're going to take physics and then we're going to take cubism and something else and something else, it can sound really almost ex esoteric and, and really difficult to comprehend. And I read 50 pages, the first 50 pages of the book. And I told my partner, I said, 
This is one of the most beautifully written books I've read in a very long time. I want to send this to about 100 CEOs immediately, because even though you put them in those lenses of physics and of art, you put it in a beautifully accessible way. So really, really well done. So thank you for that. Troy, I very much appreciate your words. Um, we will be putting the book to bed and printing it in the, in the near future. What we're doing right now is, much as you, you found it really easy to read, we still think that there's room to polish many of the sentences with a final round of sub-editing so that the, the effort required to read each sentence is the minimum needed to understand the content of the sentence and put it into practical use in your life. Uh, so we're just holding off to find the right sub-editor and get it sub-edited, and then it will be going off to press as the third book that our brand new publishing company publishes, and it will be the first Fair Shares Commons publishing company in the world. That, wow. that's, that's really wow. good. But you know, at some point, you can only polish a diamond to a certain degree. And then yeah. it disappears. <laughs> Oh, let me let me, let me tell you a little story, therefore, about uh, my art. So when I uh, when I did the second half of my BA up in Hamburg in graphic design, I did I took painting classes, um, and I worked with an artist, a quite renowned artist over in Hamburg at the time, and he actually told me exactly that, which helped me greatly when I was writing my book over the last two years. You know about how to get to is it perfect enough? Is it good enough? For, you know, and 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 he said, well, you know. Uh, there are always pieces to work at, but at some point you have to stop because you're gonna find other things once you stop and you move on to the next thing. So there's 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 about you know how much can you learn from this as much as I think I think in particular with with a message like that and you know I love bigger ideas and I know they're always really hard to communicate because oftentimes you need to find a new narrative for these kind of things um, and that's always hard to get to people. Um, but what a lot of people say, like, just just get it out. Because you actually never know who's going to actually pick it up. So the quicker you get it out and the more time you give yourself to just put it out there and work on it. And I definitely experienced that on my book as well, is to, you know, uh, you suddenly realize things are coming back. And then you're already like, okay, that definitely is going to rather go into the second book. It's, you know, the first step is often the hardest, but it's never going to be perfect. And so... You know, I think this is this is a really good book. I mean, um, uh, again, you know, like Troy said, there's so much in there. It's such a big, complex things to tackle. And I think just through the metaphors you use with, with art and quantum physics, I think it works really well. But that gets me a little bit to sort of the one big thing, obviously, um, I want to talk about, which is which is around what we met, Graham, which is the, the fair share comments. Um and that's the real that's the real big one. So um, over the last couple of episodes, and be, obviously through all the years, um, Troy and me have been working on all sorts of things. And the same for you, you know. One of the big hurdles is not to be more creative and more innovative. Somewhere it always fails and breaks with the legal structure of any organization which says your first thing you have to do is for your shareholders and the quicker you go into... Um, short-term benefits and you look at that and you show very quickly that you can improve something or bring some more money back that's the main focus and that legally binds an organization or most companies up so badly that they just can never quite ever get out of that and give themselves the freedom to actually do what they're supposed to be doing yeah so therefore the fair share commons is the big idea so can you can you a little bit elaborate more and tell us a bit more about that what it means if it's really a pipe dream and a far away idea, or as we discussed before, right, there's companies already that have been existing for a while that people don't even know about that actually have implemented some of that or they exist in, in that kind of legal framework. Is that correct? Yes, I'll dive into that. Uh, let me start with a concrete example that everybody listening to this podcast is likely to know, and they probably have in their wallet a square piece of plastic with the brand of this company, the Visa, Cor oh, the Visa Corporation. Um, so the Visa Corporation, when it was founded, uh, DHOC, who was the catalyst for the Visa Corporation to come into existence and the first CEO, 
he was really clear that for the Visa Corporation to do what it needed to do, which was to unite all of the competing banks who were all trying to launch credit cards, unite them in such a way that the credit card business as a whole could take off and each bank could continue to compete with the other banks in terms of their client base, the Visa Corporation had to be a company that satisfied many of the characteristics of the Fair Shares Commons. So the Visa Corporation was incorporated as a company that could not be bought or sold. It was a stock-based membership corporation. The shares could not be traded at all. If a member ceased to qualify to be a member of the Visa Corporation, they couldn't sell their shares to anybody else. If if they merged with another company, the newly merged entity had to reapply for membership. The shares that the one member had had could not be transferred into the merged entity. And D is very clear in his book, uh, One From Many, that the it was precisely this way of structuring the company that was at the heart of Visa turning the hemorrhaging of value that the credit card industry and the banks were going through at that point, turning that around and creating what um, has since then consistently been one of the most valuable companies in the world. So the Visa Corporation is gives ample evidence that it works, it's phenomenally successful, and you could already do this in the 60s with a US company. One of the big myths that has emerged in the past half century is that a company exists to maximize total shareholder return. And that's actually a myth that has emerged in part because of economic thinking and neoliberal thinking, bringing that in as, let's call it makeup after the fact. But if you look at, for example, in the UK, in England and Wales, the way that company law is actually written, what's written there is that the executives of the company have a duty to enable the company to maximally fulfill its purpose. There's nothing in company law in England and Wales that says that purpose has to be maximizing total shareholder return. So are you actually, sorry, Graham, are you actually saying then, is, so is that more US law or why do we believe that is such a, I, I haven't looked up the law, so I, I don't know about that. But, you know, yes. in my sense, whenever I read things, it seems like a legal part of it. But it doesn't, so you say it certainly doesn't exist in UK and Ireland. Wales. It doesn't exist there. Is it a US thing? Is that why we think maybe it's a thing? Not or in the US know? either. The US wow. as well um, states that the, the duty is to maximize the purpose of the company. The, the thing where this has come in um, is primarily if the purpose is not defined. And most company founders up until very recently simply didn't define a clear purpose for the company in a way that was legally watertight. And then the interpretation was that if there's no explicitly defined purpose, then the implicit purpose must be to serve the needs of the investors. And that's where this whole total shareholder return has come in. Now, that's interesting because I'd never heard it positioned so clearly. So because they didn't put the effort in to define a purpose, they were left with the default and the default was to maximize value to shareholders. Yeah, and even like, you know, when we talked to, I think, what episode three or something, Tom Peters, he was referring us back to the Drucker Institute over in the US and says, you know, the Drucker Institute itself tries to change that and find alternatives to propose to organizations to, to have a different focus off of that thing that holds us back to really do and, you know, uh, be there for the purpose of society, essentially, rather than the purpose of the, 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 um, the shareholders. 
So they, they, I don't know if they believe in the same thing or if they have a different reason why they want to create a new narrative to say, you know, shareholder value, forget about it. Um, wow, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Part of the issue now is that this has become, let's say, so established in the conventional interpretation of what the law says that in some countries the law has now been modified to fit this interpretation. So some in some countries it actually is in the law. In other countries, you know, in the UK and the US fall into this category. Whilst it's still perfectly possible to put in the purpose, if you didn't do it when you first incorporate it, the probability that you can then do it afterwards and get the shareholders to agree to that change in your incorporation statutes gets smaller and smaller the more valuable the company gets. And in particular, in the startup world, as soon as you get VC backed and the VCs are driven by their <clears throat> partners to, to push for a sale of the company as the kind of exit, you know, then it becomes almost impossible to retrofit that. Most of the time, um, even historically, the point where this really caused problems was not in the day-to-day -day running of the company. It was at the point where something went wrong and there was a court case. And then in the absence of any specifically declared purpose, all that the judges could do is interpret it in the best way that they could, given the facts on paper. And that led to the interpretation it's to increase total shareholder return. Hmm. So, is there, so essentially, at least for the UK and US, and you just mentioned other countries might have changed their laws now to incorporate it. There's, a, there's actually no reason apart from the power of the existing shareholders, the fear of the leadership to go, if you don't go with the shareholders, money gets pulled out or we get booted out. I don't even know exactly how that works, but you know, it's actually just that that holds companies back to pivot or refocus on what they actually should be doing. Yeah, and yes. pivot yeah. is the word that I was going to you know, ask in as well, yeah. because let's say a startup starts off trying to serve hospitals, but in the process of trying to solve a particular problem in the hospitals, they pivot and they're suddenly serving pharmacies. You know, it's still kind of same space, but it, it changes the fundamental purpose. And, and that means they'd have to go back and amend the Articles of Incorporation to redefine the purpose if they pivoted. That would depend very much on how the purpose in the Articles of Incorporation is defined. <clears throat> um, yeah. F first of all, I actually recommend define the purpose after you've defined what is the cut the context and the need that is served by that purpose so that as soon as the context and the need changes you automatically build in the need to redefine the purpose so i think that's a really really strong point because i think um you know like put, putting it back to to covid19 but i think also if i look at at least the last seven eight years when i was working across multiple industries i think most predominant predominantly so when i was working at advertising agencies i'm working with loads of uh different brands apart from the fact you know a couple of png brands so you know all about that ground um Indeed. having having worked there too is you know where as an agency we were often held to look at the brand of a company and go okay um we know how are you as an agency tell us what our purpose is tell us how we should look you know uh, as a company to the outside world because this is sort of our image and this is sort of also a purpose and ad agencies at some point started to go and say well you have to sh you should try this higher purpose thing like be around sustainability or you know preserving part of the planet or something that is a, is, is a higher purpose and not just here's a product and we're good at that product um that was always seen as that's not good enough because actually just giving someone a product doesn't really cover or isn't emotionally close enough to a need. So, you know, since then we have customer centricity and all these things becoming recognized as actually a better value, a very qualitative, beyond quantitative 
value that can exponentially increase the value of your products, but also the way you solve people's problems. And that's where it starts to become really interesting because actually this is the thing that should happen first. As you said, a company should probably write in their uh, starting document or revisit it at times to go, are we still fit for a purpose? Has the purpose changed because our world has changed? And that, that's when the COVID thing comes in where you say, well, the need has changed now. There's a new need for people in that section that we served before. So is there anything you reckon organizations can do? Uh, but before you go better, there, Marcus, or, let, let, let's go yeah. back. Tell us about fair share of comments. Now, now we all agree that there is indeed a situation. There's a lot of misunderstanding. Ah. Tell us about yeah. fair share of comments. Yeah. Right, I'll dive into that and then weave it into what Marcus has said. So, thank you. Imagine the the situation: you're a successful company, and something like COVID nineteen comes in. The company is now under stress. Most modern companies have far more of their value lying in the human capital than in any of the other assets of the company. If you think of a company like um, Google, for example, if every single person in Google walked out of the door and didn't come back in again the next morning, the residual value of Google is low. Most of the value of Google lies in the human beings that are completely free to walk out the door and not come back again the next day. So if you're in a modern company, the most important thing is to really maximize how much of each individual's time and energy, in particular their discretionary effort, goes into delivering results in the company. You want to minimize the amount of time and effort that goes into what I sometimes call job two after Keegan into the effort of protecting themselves, showing up and looking good in the company despite the internal politics, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the best way of doing that is already well recognized in the co-op world. If all of the staff have a fair amount of voting rights in the general meetings and all of the staff have a fair share of the wealth generated by the company, All of a sudden, the interests of the investors and the staff are aligned. And now the staff are far more likely to go the extra mile to really work in the interest of the company because the balance of risk reward between investors and staff is now there. Whereas for a normal limited company, in times of crisis, if the staff give up on money, uh, take a lower salary, put in extra effort without any guaranteed salary, they're carrying a huge amount of the risk. And the only reward they will get is they get their salary back again, which is not a balanced risk reward anymore. Whereas the investors, well, they're not actually carrying much residual risk anymore because the value of the company probably collapsed in the first place when the crisis hit. So their shares either way are not worth much. And they have all of the upside potential for reward if the staff turn it around. The Fair Shares Commons takes what we already know works really well from cooperatives. For example, the Mondragon Cooperative in Spain, during the previous recession in 2008, They didn't add a single person to Spanish unemployment statistics because of the way that a cooperative keeps risk-reward in balance. So the Fair Shares Commons simply takes this to the logical conclusion. Now you include not just the staff and the investors in the general meeting with governance rights and wealth share rights, you include all of the other major stakeholders that have a role to play in the success of the business. And the final bit is you recognize and take truly seriously the central tenet of business law, which is that the business is an independent legal being 
compared to any of the human beings involved in the business. And so law states or law declares that there are two types of legal beings. There are human legal beings and non-human legal beings, i.e. incorporated entities. And so the fair shares common simply takes that to the final logical point of saying, okay, if that's really true, that a company is a non-human legal being, as you and I are legal human being or human legal beings, we need to regard the company really seriously as a fully independent legal being. And then you see that the company satisfies Eleanor Ostrom's description of a commons and that the company is actually will function best if we take it really seriously and structure it as a commons of productive capacity with all of the stakeholders engaged with the company as part of contributing to this commons of productive capacity, part of benefiting from the commons, and therefore part of speaking on behalf of the commons, part of governing or stewarding the commons, very much in the same way that the trustees of a trust will engage with the trust, uh, or as the parents of a child will engage with the child. They don't own the child, but they have an accountability for raising the child to be a viable, responsible adult. So it, you, people have heard me say it several times on this particular podcast that I, I keep trying to figure out how do we reinvent capitalism to get balance between stakeholders. So very much aligned with, with what you're talking about by putting the employees and, you know, front and center as being on par with the shareholders. But typically, I also include other stakeholders. Customers are stakeholders. Society at large, i.e. in how they pay taxes, is a stakeholder. And, you know, external uh, externalities, external consequences on the environment are indeed stakeholders. So is there part of including indirect people in this fair shares commons approach? Absolutely. That's right at the heart of it. What I see is that long term, the environment will be a stakeholder in all fair shares commons companies. There will be representatives in the general meeting speaking on behalf of the environment and exercising their voting rights as stewards speaking on behalf of the environment. Even Perhaps even more importantly, the dividends that they receive, the share of the capital appreciation of the company that they receive, they will be duty bound to spend that for the environment. They are in loco parentis for the environment. Equally, things like uh, local taxation, the, the money that the com local communities get from businesses to invest in the community infrastructure that the business as a whole depends on to function. Governments, in terms of the taxes that they get to keep the whole country functioning at an infrastructure level, if all companies were fair shares commons, most of that could come in directly, them coming in as stakeholders that have governance rights and wealth share rights in a highly collaborative, symbiotic, win-win-win approach, rather than the current approach, which is through taxation and legislation, which is a combative us versus them approach that just creates the opportunity for various kinds of games to come in that simply suck value out of the system rather than multiplying the value in the system. Yeah, they're also quite ineffective, right? So exactly what you're saying, I was just like listening to you and go, oh my God, yeah, that is exactly talking about cutting out the middleman, in this case, the government, because mm -hmm. why would you not have a company that's made out of people who live in a certain area, have the company that produces other things, but contributes or in that you know, which is surely part of what we could call circular economy kind of style things. Um, 
to contribute directly to those things like let's say give money to rebuild a park or something like that or roads and whatnot and so you wouldn't actually even have to pay for the extra management overhead of debt being taxed going to the government and then being put back into uh building streets after a tender to a company to build the streets or a br bridge or something like that it could literally directly go there exactly. which would then question or would be super interesting how that I, th I you know just in my head this would be you're atomizing voting because you're not just voting for a person that represents x amount of money and taxes to be distributed and laws to put in place to change things but you would directly say right because i'm working at that company their company supports those kind of things i'm in the company voting against go towards either the park or the bridge and i want the bridge so this money to some extent goes rather in that it's a direct correlation between the value as a worker i produce and the impact that then has of that some of that value being put directly into the community i mean that's a it's a, what i love about these kind of thoughts is, and ideas is that from a technology from a technology standpoint as much as digital voting is totally could could totally be a thing it's doable right i mean you know maybe i want to ask troy around you know using blockchain or any of that to enable these kind of things should be totally doable yeah but, but right? before you go down the blockchain angle and i was, I was really trying hard not Sorry. to do that <laughs> because i, I yeah. always wind up in blockchain that's what i do but i think the other thing is there are so many people that are desperate for a small government I mean, in the U.S., the whole bonfire of regulations, you know, we no more new regulations because it's crippling business. In a fair shares commons structured business, there is far less need for regulation because the incentives are already aligned. Precisely. And I'll pick up on that briefly. There's a U.S. president, for the moment I forget which one it was that said this. He was asked at one point, why he had invited into um, his central circle somebody who has consistently been an opponent of his. And the reply was, well, I'd far rather have him inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. Hi, yeah. <laughs> and this is the whole essence of the Fair Shares Commons company. We need regulation, court cases, lawyers, all of the money that is hemorrhaged into the system that is lost to productivity. We need that because we've invented a game of opposition. The Fair Shares Commons Company, it brings everybody into the tent and it maximizes the opportunity for them to collaborate. And so absolutely, paradoxically, the Fair Shares Commons meets the needs both of the left and the right. It leads to light, minimalistic government, which on the one side, people, some people love, and at the same time, it achieves many of the objectives as Mondragon in Spain illustrated. They carried inside the company all of the consequences of the financial crisis in 2008 because of the way they structured. They didn't need to put any load on the state, so it was state light, but it wasn't at the expense of any individual nor at the expense of any businesses. So they actually delivered on all of the interests of the left as well. Um, th I mean, this that's, is that's beautiful. Just, yeah, I think this is just literally the first idea I ever heard that would give me hope to ever rein back in the Republicans onto something that going to be very, very okay. white here. The, the, to, the, to the, Republicans, good, right? the, the Republicans are, are going to be happy because there's going to be smaller government and less regulation. So it's not about necessarily reining them back in, but it, it does give me a certain amount of hope. Now, I can hear in the back of my head a bunch of people, not necessarily me, I'm more of a, a growth person than I am a, a lack person, but somebody saying, ooh, if the environment is going to win, if employees are going to win, if customers are going to win, Who's going to lose? So, so tell us, Graham, is this going to take all of this kind of other people winning and take value away from the shareholder? Are they going to get smaller dividends or going to get smaller growth? Because that's what people start thinking. Well, if you're going to do all that, then you're going to have to take it out of my pocket to give it to somebody else. Well, you always think we're going to talk about redistribution of wealth to some extent, right? I'm pretty sure. But anyway, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So... Almost everybody will win from this because the, the big idea behind this 
is make the pie bigger overall. Instead of fighting over who has the largest slice of a small pie, let's just all make the pie bigger. And it's really well proven that if you structure the way that stakeholders collaborate with each other in such a way that all of the stakeholders are enabled to put all of their energy into delivering results rather than into internal friction, you end up with a much bigger pie. So almost everybody will win out of this simply because the pie becomes so much bigger. We're stepping out of the simplistic way of win-lose thinking. And that, by the way, is at the heart of what Einstein and Picasso brought into physics and art, is we need to step out completely of our old ways of thinking and look at the situation through fundamentally new lenses. And then we can transform things. We can transcend and include. The only people who are at risk of losing out are those who are right at the extreme end of benefiting by extracting wealth from the system. And so, yes, there are some of these people will lose out at the immediate surface financial level. However, even they will gain because at the end of the day, where we're all dependent or we're all part of the, 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 the planet that we're living on. We're all dependent on the nature that we're in. And we're all embedded in the cultural system that we're in. So there are many people who are at the extreme end of wealth, where the wealth is not bringing them the kind of satisfaction, the kind of enjoyment of life, the, the well-being, the self-esteem or whatever it is that they were originally after when they went down this path, simply because they're now trapped inside an us versus them combative system. So bringing in something like the Fair Shares Commons, which transforms the entire fabric of how we structure society as well, or has the potential to do that, it opens up a lot of space for people to recognize that winning isn't just about having more money in their bank account. It's about many elements of life and how much money you have in your bank account may or may not be the most important one for you. And even if it is the most important one for you, it's certainly not the only one. This opens up space for them to win on all of those axes as well, which really means that net, it opens up space for everybody to win by simply changing the game to a different kind of game. And I, I think that's, that's right. And Marcus and I were talking about this. This is big. I mean, you're talking about changing the fabric of society, changing the basis upon which, you know, corporate, you know, non-human entities exist. It's not going to happen overnight. And even if you get a company like Visa or a company like John Lewis and Partners and the, the few ones that are out there to start moving, they're competing against a whole raft of other companies that still have the old mindset. And they will take advantage of whoever else suddenly decides to be a good upstanding citizen because they're still driving to make profit. How do we move this? What's the smallest incremental step that companies can take that starts building a true momentum of change? Because this is not going to be a light switch. We're not going to turn the light switch and suddenly society is going to realize that a holistic approach to what is wealth is, is the right way. Correct. So step one, the easiest place to start is if you are about to start up a company incorporate your startup. Seriously consider incorporating your startup as a fair shares commons. As soon as you've got that, a whole bunch of other things become a lot easier. That unleashes 
untapped capacity in all of your stakeholders to contribute to enabling this company to thrive. And I'll give you an example, the weakness you're pointing at. This is a weakness that comes from, come, or, or is only present in companies that are incorporated as standard limited companies, whether private or public. If I take as an example Unilever, Paul Polman in Unilever did a superb job during his 10 years tenure as CEO at stepping towards this paradigm. The point where he needed to pull back was the point where Kraft began a takeover bid. And at that point, he needed to row back on a few things. He needed to do that because of the way Unilever is incorporated somebody can buy the company and through that take over control. If Unilever had been incorporated as a fair shares commons at the beginning, I, I, there's not much chance of reincorporating Unilever as a fair shares commons in the near future. But had it been a fair shares commons, it could not have been sold. And so all of the excellent initiatives that Paul Polman was working on and bringing in, A, would have happened far faster. They might even have happened before he arrived and he would have just taken it even further than that. And he certainly would not have had to row back a little bit to defend against this potential takeover. Now, where that really pays off, we have the SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic right now, as we're speaking. When I was living in China in the early 2000s, SARS coronavirus 1 came in. Since then, we've also had Ebola, we've had MERS, we've had another number of health crises that have threatened the global economy. We've had financial crashes, we've had this, that, and the other. We have the climate emergency that is coming in stronger and stronger right now. Just today, I was looking at a report on the incredibly high temperatures in Siberia right now. So we can expect in the coming decade more bigger and more frequent crises that hammer businesses and the economy. Well, we have more than enough evidence from a number of companies around the world that if you incorporate in unusual ways, and the Fair Shares Commons is simply taking these ways of incorporation to the logical endpoint, you are far more likely to continue to thrive in a crisis, at least to survive. And therefore, even if your only motivation as an investor is maximizing your financial return, in a world where change crisis is the norm, you are far better off putting your money in one of these companies than in a standard type of limited company where the power to extract money, the power to use it as a tool for one individual to maximize their return at the expense of everybody else, simply by putting that potential into the company's incorporation, it, it makes the company seriously fragile whenever any crisis hits versus a fair shares commons, which is seriously anti-fragile when a crisis hits. So that's really interesting because I think even without COVID, you know, I've been in companies where, because I worked, you know, with a lot around innovation and these kind of things. So new efforts of a company to expand. So I was more in context where things get defunded very quickly because that's the first thing that goes. And that often happens from quarter to quarter, you know. So if I look at some ad agencies I worked for that, you know, let's say are either owned by publishers or Omnicom, the second they wouldn't hit their targets, they would slash stuff very quickly. So the pressure was always on, not just in dire times like this. Um, the other thing is then, you know, if we say that and we say there's a new round, a new types of startups, a new kind of organizations being built like that. Um, so are you saying there is a particular, so there is enough incentive for investors to say, you know what, I'm going to not in, 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 in invest in this market, kind of market anymore. 
that gives me more power and there's a lot of pressure on it for the wrong reasons on any organization. But actually, I invest in this purpose and because this is a... Yeah, can you talk a bit about that? So what really is that different incentive, how easy it is for... If I would be a, a, a normal investor that's been doing that with the market, not a VC, but some, you know, let's say an angel investor, is... so how much better is it than to invest in, in these new types of organizations, essentially? And and following on from that, if I'm a startup and I'm desperate for capital, if I make myself fair share of commons, is it going to be harder for me to raise that critical early capital? Yeah, could I shift even? Yeah, exactly. Yes. So diving into that, at the moment, it might be harder for a startup to raise money because the investor needs to dive into two things that are new. One of them is the business concept of the startup, and the other one is how they incorporate. So there's certainly a smaller pool of investors who will be willing to dive into understanding both. For the investor, though, once the investor has understood this, then it becomes visible that by incorporating as a fair shares commons, you shift the whole game. It's now instead of either I put my money into something that is going to make huge amounts of money back for me, or I put my money into something that does good, now the fair shares commons turns this from an either or opposition into a, a self-reinforcing circle. The fair shares commons means that it, it really tackles one of the issues with impact investing, where most of the focus is on how do we have impact and not that much focus is on the return on investment. This really makes impact investing work as well from the investment side as pure profit investing and as well on the impact side as pure impact focus. And the reason for that is very simple. The fair shares commons eliminates the wastage that exists if you do either or by bringing the two together. And that means you have far more time and effort and human energy going into making the pie bigger which simply means that there's more impact on the impact side and more money on the financial return side. So we essentially somewhat, yeah, cutting out multiple middlemen. One is the financial or, you know, be it potentially different currency that we're creating and not looking at the financial aspect and refocusing on what, what, what in other places we could call outcome-based. Yeah, the purpose. The purpose is achieving a particular outcome and focusing on that and investing in that. Um, but I, I hear people yeah. in the background, in the back of my mind saying, yeah. Ooh, but that might be risky. And if there's one thing yeah. corporations hate, there's one thing investors hate, it's, it's risk. They love the, I think the it's promise, not but I'm not sure that they're comfortable that, that it could actually happen. And we need more evidence. We need more visas, more John Lewis's. Yeah, and that's not just, you know, like, you know, risk is one thing, but even even with something like, let's say, service design, customer centricity, uh, or when we talk to Richard about, you know, beha behavioral science, that are all great mechanics and methodologies to look at, hang on a second, isn't it about people? Isn't it about, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, fulfilling the need and solving the problem? for people out there in society. And I want to a little bit tie that back as well, because maybe there's this, not trying to make things more complex, but I think it's it's, it's a great point because you you mentioned Graham somewhere. Um, I think it's Keegan. And I, I'm, I'm picking up again on a quote from, from Tom Peters, who after 40 years of working with lots of organizations is so, his bottom line is like people first, right? If you treat your people right, you're going to have a great company. Um, and, and you talk about, I think it's King, I might get the name wrong, about the different levels of maturity and that the purpose of, of an organization could be just to, to, to elevate, to grow, 
what people can do and how they grow themselves. And Tom Peter said exactly that. The purpose of an organization could actually be, internally at least, to grow the people who work there and externally to solve the needs of the people that are out there. So it actually fulfills two needs and has two purposes, internally and externally. They're both positive. And that's what everything should be based around. Uh, so do you want to maybe talk a little bit about Keegan, if that's the right meant with these five levels of maturity, or generally, you know, is there a correlation between the purpose uh, for an organization outside what they do, the value, and inside? Is 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 that sort of all connected or not, or how does that play? Absolutely, it's it's all connected, and one of the things that we've developed in Evolute Six is a maturity model for organizations that looks at the maturity in the human dimension, in the organization structure, roles, and task dimension, and in the legal incorporation. So uh, legally, the fair shares commons is the highest level five maturity. The highest level five maturity on the human dimension, again, is where development is one of the purposes of the company and inseparable from any other purpose of the company. And it's really clear, only if a company is level five on all three dimensions, is it going to be truly powerful and successful long term. Any company that is not, especially in the times of crisis we're in, is not going to get there. And development as a purpose really means that a core part of the purpose of the company is raising the stage of development of every person in the company. Not doing this, the consequences of not doing this are really visible right now in the world, both in the business world and in the political world. Developing an individual means fundamentally developing three lines of development in the individual. The first one is their fluidity in using forms of thought that go beyond simple binary logic. And you know, Bill Gates said that one of the key indicators of a CEO that really has what it takes is the capacity to hold opposing thoughts in their head simultaneously and work with them even though they're mutually contradictory. That's a central capacity that any top leader needs in today's world. So development as a purpose means you develop people to develop that capacity because that's the capacity you need for the business to succeed in nebulous VUCA times. The second line of development you have to develop is the maturity of meaning-making of each individual. You know, and Keegan's stages model is a good way of uh, re referring to that. And that's simply different stages source their self their self identity from different places. And the leaders of a business today, especially a big business, they have to source their self identity from inside themselves rather than from outside themselves. And in particular, they need to recognize that their self-identity needs to have a fluidity so that they can respond appropriately to the rapidly changing context that they're embedded in. They can't afford to be anchored in the opinion of others, nor can they afford to be anchored in principles that were absolutely perfect 10 years ago, but are now out of tune with the values that are actually necessary and relevant today. And the final line of development that the company has to take care of if we're to have the kind of leaders that we need in the future is each of us comes in with our nature, things that we can't change. You know, I'm tall and skinny, I'm never gonna change that. I need to develop ways of being subtle with my hardwired nature that I can't change so that I can show up with my full unique power powerfully 
without any of my unique weaknesses harming what I'm trying to do. And again, that's a core part of the organization. As Peter Drucker says, the organization is a tool that human beings invent so that large numbers of us can work together in a way where our strengths are useful and our weaknesses are irrelevant. That's a great quote. I'm look, just looking at the time and I'm, I know I have at least another five, ten questions. Um, <laughs> we always get to this point. As usual. Here. As usual. So I'm going to do a little bit of a odd statement, maybe, because I think, um, you know, in the podcast, we're always trying to give people something that is quite actionable. And I think the thing that I'm hearing here, which I, which, which I know always helped me whenever I walked into any bigger complex organization. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the, 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 the comparison here between as an individual walk into a, into a big organization and basically walking in into essentially a paradigm shift. You know, if I would start working with PNG or HSBC or Nationwide or BT, whatever, I would walk in there and it's a different culture. It's a different thing. It's a different world, right? Uh, so from yesterday when I didn't know much about it to today when I'm in the middle of it, trying to find out what's really going on, how people do things, and they're different. Everything's different. It's change is hitting me. That's a situation where I'd usually benefit from the fact of what you just described, where I was able to go back to what the essence of me is, because that's the thing that gets me back to the core value I represent and therefore that can't shake me despite the change. And the other part, which is I look at what's in front of me, what my new reality is, and this new reality can contradict itself or it con can contradict to the point like, well, I look at things like this way and this thing that stares back at me looks at it in a different way. How can I put this together? And I might end up with compromises and, Two things might be equally true. However, as long as I can recognize them and understand them enough and learn more about them, I'll be fine. And change is not scary. I can move forward. So I think that sounds to me, and that goes a lot with the maturity level section. You're saying it's leadership and organizations who should aim at a higher maturity level. And I think it's, it's the individual worker these days. And probably if I... If my money would be on it, I would say a lot of organizations are facing the fact that they have to cut a lot of people um, and then they have to ask their remaining people to do more, to have multiple opinions and multiple viewpoints and build up skills really quickly and shifting paradigms in order to cope with what's now staring at us as well. So I think you're making a great point exactly of that to be quite the essence of what's probably ahead of us and as an action to focus on that and go, how can I help my people and the organization to do that, to deal with these new things? Is that sort of, is, is, if it, is that sort of a little bit what you said? That's um, absolutely at the heart of it. And it's why I see all of these things as so integrated and interconnected is that if we think of it in this way, then let's say that a company is in a crisis and they're faced with the choice of do I keep people or do I let people go? If the company is incorporated as a fair shares commons, people are far more likely to stay and each person will find the appropriate balance between investment risk and expected future reward because their relationship with the company is no longer one of subordination their relationship with the company is one of equals and you don't exploit the other person instead you you work together to maximize the chances of success if the company is level five in terms of how it works with people, you maximize how much human energy and ingenuity and creativity is freely available to deliver results and minimize the amount of human energy and time that is going into protecting oneself. 
And then if you're at level five in terms of how you structure the organization around roles and tasks and work, again, you're maximizing the amount of effort that goes into delivering results. You're maximizing the design of the organization to be just what is needed to maximize the efficiency and minimize the amount of energy that is wasted in useless political battles between silos, arguments between, let's say, finance and marketing about how much money should be spent for how much money that might come in, etc. Yeah. And so in a time of crisis, if you're at level five on all three axes, you will be far more successful on any measure of success than a traditional company. Yeah, I think that's... It's 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 really powerful stuff, and uh, you know it also reminds me back to, you know, reinventing organizations with Frederick Lalou. And by the way, Frederick Lalou, if you listen to this, contact me. We want to talk to you too. You know, um, I love I love the parallel, and it's like so. It's it's uh, yet again. There's so much in this book. I think it's beautiful the way you put it together, Graham, and and and, and your co-writer um, Jack, um, and. Uh, it's 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 worth reading in times like these because I think it gives you through the through the use and the reference to art and 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 quantum mechanics and these things it it gives you a really great shift it gives you a really great shift of view on on what everyone already looked at for a long time to change to see new things and the other part is the fact that it brings you back to the essence of who you are as a company, as an individual, because it, it, it does both things, right? You do things on a more organizational level. You do things on a personal level. And I think it's 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 it's, it's great that someone did that in one book. As Troy said earlier, it's great to bring this together because it's all interconnected, as you said. It's all interconnected. We need to sort of shift all levels. Otherwise, we'll, we might not get there. So... Um, it's uh, As usual, Graham, you know, you know this. Uh, we could talk for hours mm -hmm. um, it's always beautiful to talk to you so i thank you very much for making time for us and and have a great chat and uh thank you and and yes just one more time for for you and for everyone listening it is a beautifully written book even before you send it for the final sub edit uh, i i really plan to get a chance to, to read it again not just because I'm reading it because I want to do the podcast with you, but just to really absorb everything I missed the first time. Thank you for your time so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Troy. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you for listening to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. You can find all relevant links and a way to contact us in the description. And please like, share and subscribe. And we hope we see you next time.